I think we had a very good and interesting ride so far. Um, when you look at this, you will see there's one name missing. It's, it's Nicolaus Hirsch. Unfortunately, he had an emergency at home and uh, couldn't come at short notice. Uh, he sends his greetings, and I'm sure he will appear in Vienna sooner or later at another, on another occasion. Um, my task now is, uh, it, the panel is about transformation design, and I can tell you it's really a huge challenge. Uh, yesterday I briefly talked about it, so I won't repeat that, but basically it's when you want to change society, when you want to change civilization, uh, you set goals. The famous goals, the UN, the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, many other goals, but you also have to design and devise ways and means to get there. And very often the latter is even more complicated than the former. I give you an example. If you, for instance, say our goal is because, let's be uh, hopeful, a majority of people want a car-free city, then of course you have to design a transformation uh, to get to this goal of a car-free city. Sometimes you set a goal and it turns out that while you are, you are on your way, um, the goal is an underestimation, or is under complex. For instance, if you say let's reduce meat consumption by 50%, and you, this is silly examples, but and you suddenly discover, no, we need to reduce it by 90%, then of course you also have to change the transformation design. And then there are also cases where you set a goal and it turns out, while you're already on your way, that the, that the goal is superseded by a new technology. Let's say there's an intelligence explosion and suddenly a new te technology is discovered for cars that make electric cars old-fashioned and you have to change course. So these are all examples telling you why transformation design is very important and we might discuss um, this also from that perspective later on but first we have the three presentations and I don't give you the entire CVs uh, but I want to uh, say why I think people are really special. You've seen from the presentations yesterday and today, we carefully selected people who are special and who really contribute to changing values. And that's also the case, of course, with this last panel. So Harald Gründel uh, has a long established uh, cooperation with the MAC. He's a co-founder, one of the three co-founders of EOS Design, highly acclaimed international design studio successful in many parts of the world, but he also founded the Institute of Design Research Vienna. And of course, uh, EOS, and particularly also him, have dedicated a lot of time and energy to projects in social and sustainable design. Uh, they are working on toilets. Uh, when I'm in a dinner conversation and I bring up toilets, then some people say, whoa, why is he talking now about toilets? But it's so important, the toilet revolution and whatever you did for the global north, for the global south in terms of uh, urine separation or uh, other toilets, diversion toilets, etc., etc. And we were very successful, VSA, the MAC, Madis Viet, me, and EOS with uh, the toilet revolution in Milano at the Broken Nature Triennale that just ended. And the project next year, uh, next week, will be shown at the MAC, so please come to see it. Uh, it's a wonderful installation on the Toilet Revolution that will be on view till the end of the Vienna Biennale. And there will be a special event on October 1, our design night devoted to the topic. And Harald also, uh, to end here, uh, was a curator of the last uh, Vienna Biennale. So he has a Vienna Biennale history, and so has Anab Jain. Uh, thank you also, Anab, for coming. Uh, you are not only a designer, but also a filmmaker and co-founder of Superflux, uh, a critically acclaimed foresight design and technology company in London, 
working for lots of illustrious clients, both cultural institutions but also companies such as Google, media, etc., etc. You have won many honors from all over the world. Um, you worked also with us, and you are, of course, our highly uh, esteemed neighbor as a professor and program leader for design innovations at the University of Applied Art, Arts, and we hope you will stay there for a long time. Um, Johannes Strohmeyer is very special because what I admire so is his range. You know, range is a very important quality these days. It's not about being specialized in one thing and that's it. He talked about the walls between the disciplines and of course people can be very successful um, in meaningful ways when they have range and they uh, know how to behave and adapt to many different circumstances. He's an Austrian entrepreneur and investment banker, investor, also in startups, so especially in startups. He studied economics and communication, dissertation at Stanford, doctorate at the University of Vienna, and worked as an accountant, tax consultant, court certified expert, but he was also chairman of the Tax Reform Commission of the Federal Ministry of Finance in 98. I give you these examples because you understand then the range, yeah? and I'm not talking about other things I know about your range that are not on your CV, but you are, were also managing partner and, uh, at Hübner and Hübner. Uh, you were in politics for a certain time, and of course you follow politics very closely. You were top candidate in the European elections for the Liberalis Forum in 1999. Of course, member of numerous supervisory boards, acquisition of all shares in Austrian equities AG, and so on. There's a Dr. Strohmeyer Foundation also, but, and this is also interesting in this context, you are not only a board member of the Hundertwasser Gemeinnützige Privatstiftung, and a lot of people in this room admire Hundertwasser for his vision, yeah, including Harald Gründel. Uh, and, but he's also uh, on the board of the AZW here, which is great. So we're looking forward to your presentations. Uh, Harald Gründel is the first, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph, for the introduction. Um, what you have not mentioned is that we have collaborated on a really <laughs> on a, an, an challenging project for this year's biannual in, for change. And Christoph was our, in a way, <clears throat> gave us the chance to, to, to work on a collaboration with the Ministry of Tourism and Sustainability, the Austrian Ministry. And I think it's, it's they are quite used to have experts um, advising their um, policy decision making. I think what they have not yet used is the ability of design to think about the future and to reflect on how things are done. So <clears throat> we were quite um, it was, we were really happy to, to enter this project and we started to read a policy paper which is called um, Mission 2030. So I think it's not the only paper which has that name. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a kind of near future projection of um, how society should change and transform it was highly criticized by a couple of NGOs because of not that they criticized the ideas which are in the paper, but what has been criticized was there was absolutely no concrete idea how to bring that to the ground. So it was just um, a kind of buzzwords um, 
that created a kind of imaginary um, society. And when you hear what our politicians are proposing in terms of transition into a more sustainable society, I think we see that these kind of papers are not very, um, they do not really guide the doings of our politicians. So in order to create some emergency, we, the, the first uh, part of our title is climate change. Uh, and for us, climate change is not just where we are still in, you know, we have this kind of climate crisis already, but climate change in a poetical sense means as well that the climate changes as well for our doing. It's not just, you know, the, the, the big scale of, of, of the climate and then temperature rising and all these kind of things. But what we feel since, since Greta Thunberg was really, you know, um, in, 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 the, in, in the media and, and in, I think that that changed a lot, not only the mind of people which are already have the right mindset, but it, it, it widened up the, the possibility to think about a, um, a change and then transition. And so we came up with a subtitle, um, which is from mass consumption, which is totally clear our problem today. It's a kind of mass consumption, which is driven really by an aggressive capitalism. And what we try to, to understand is how we can move from that concept of, of of economy to something which Christoph called a sustainable quality society. Um, I like the term because I'm not really totally sure what it is. So it gave us really the possibility to be more free in, in what we do. So it, it's, you know, we are here and, and what's there is, is not totally clear. But it has some, you know, it has the sustainability in and, and quality is, of course, something which in, in the last 25 years of our work as designers is, was always something which we were seeking. So, <clears throat> this is an exhibition view and interestingly you see all the projects that we did for this exhibition on this, on this uh, image here. I'm not going to explain all of these uh, projects today, but I, I, I selected three of them and, and try to go a little bit deeper. Um, what, we, what we had in mind is, and this is something we learned from, from um, all these conversations we had in, in, in the exhibition is, that we feel and that there is a circle around all these um, objects here, which is a kind of ritual circle. And what we feel is we need to create formats. Uh, we need to create um, a space to discuss about our future. And I think museums are just one of the options to do so. But I think we, we need more of these options to have a safe um, and not aggressive conversation about how we, we dream together our future. Um, what was um, interesting for us as well, because we as um, EOS designers, we are really used to work with the big industry. So we work in US for Herman Miller and we have worked in retail for 10 years for brands like Giorgio Armani and Adidas. So, so we really we usually work for brands and this informs a lot what we do because you have to fit in a way what um, a brand image is. And, and this was, I think, not for the first time, but it, it was a very intense time to understand not working for brands but just work on, on, on topics. And in order to bring down this difficult 
um, this difficulty to have this um, rather not so concrete paper to bring it down to earth, we decided to we decided to choose some very um, common objects where everyone has an everyday experience with them. So as another background, um, when we started this project, I, I was um, working on this text on 95 design thesis. And this text was um, a rather critical um, observation of our everyday consumer culture. So it's, <clears throat> um, as Anna Chine is now uh, the next one, um, design education is the license to destroy the environment, which I really, um, it's, it's not just, it's not addressing a specific university, but I'm totally sure, and that I know that because of my work in the Institute of Design Research, students are not really educated to deal with these complex problems. Um, they still work in a bubble um, of what we thought is design, you know, in the last 20 years. Um, <clears throat> and I think it reads nearly very concrete tools in order to have more knowledge about, um, for example, the circular economy. And the thesis 86 is copyrights are not protecting but hindering creativity. Um, you know, when we speak about transition, we have to speak about using a new mindset, a new paradigms in, in our work. And I've not yet transition designer on my business card, and maybe it take some time so that I will do so. But you know, our, all of our business at EOS is just based on copyrights, you know. So it, it's starting from my, you know, very um, small perspective. This is something, how, how can I base my income into a new business concept, which is not working on, on something which I'm, you know, totally sure it doesn't, it doesn't help us in order to overcome these this kind of challenges. There, there is another um, project I worked with the Institute of Design Research and we, we launched um, this little pocket guide here on circular design. I'll maybe give this through the... So unfortunately, it's in, in German only at the moment, but we, because of, of, of really big requests, we are, we are translating it at the moment. And <clears throat> it's difficult to make a pocket guy on, on sustainable design, you know. It's, it's, uh, but what it does is it, it, it sketches a little bit, um, you know, because we're speaking um, on values, we, we try to sketch out what should basically um, change. So we have to come from a linear economy to a circular economy. And we have to include different actors in this, in this complex, in this complex um, situation. Of course, good educated designers are nice to have, but we had also have to have um, people in the companies, producers, which are willing to change their business model. I'll come to that later. We need politics. So we're speaking about since the last five to 10 years on carbon taxing or having more tax on, on resources, which would really help to accelerate this kind of systemic change. And we need consumers 
which change a little bit their attitude from um, for example buying things in order to, to <clears throat> you can use things and not possess them so this is uh, easy to, to explain but it's difficult emotionally for, for many people and there, it turns out there is some categories of objects where we do better with this idea and this, I think this is one of the levers we, we have at the moment. And I think one of the big challenges we have to overcome in creativity is to have, we have to collaborate. So the design business is still, and I think it's the same a little bit with the academic business, it's still a, a very, very uh, business which is not very collaborative, but it's, it's uh, competitive, so we need to learn to cooperate. Yeah, and I raised the, the issue of patents and copyrights. There, there is an easy solution for, the, for that, it's Creative Commons. So this is a system of open design which is perfectly <clears throat> managed by, um, <clears throat> which is perfectly managed and give you the possibility to, to better balance um, what you want and what do you not want with your um, creative solutions. So I jump into the um, three projects. So the first project we have named Kitchen Cow. And the Kitchen Cow is a biodigesting system for the kitchen. And you see basically the elements. So you have a, a workbench, like in the kitchen, and you have um, the other bigger pro, um, object is a, is a container for the biogas. And this is an exhibition view of the project. And when we sp were speaking and, and discussing with Christoph, we, we, we always had in mind that this, this future, which is more sustainable, means in many discussions giving away things, losing things, losing maybe um, quality of life, using, um, losing lots of things. And what we want to show with our project, you're gaining something. You gain maybe a new, um, like in this case, you gain um, a relation to natural cycles, like you cook and then you put the, 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 the rest uh, which you do not use, you put in this kind of glass uh, belly and there it's becoming uh, two valuable resources. One is biogas and another one is liquid fertilizer which you can use again to grow things. And then from this um, you can use the energy again in order to heat up um, the, the your meal. So we did this idea in two different versions. So that, that's the IKEA version of it. So it uses just the IKEA kitchen workbench. And we went out into um, a public, um, um, it was the Climate Kiertag where Greta Thunberg and Arnold Schwarzenegger were presenting. And we had lots of contact with just say, very down-to-earth people and discussing our, our project with them. And surprisingly, we, we thought they would say we are totally crazy, but they felt in a way attached to the idea. And, and it's, it's not a, a project which is just um, theory, but behind that project are real numbers which we um, discussed with, with scientists. A second project which touches an, another, um, another context is the Green Freeze um, refrigerator. And Green Freeze was a project by um, Greenpeace in the, when we had the ozone uh, hole. And Greenpeace did a campaign and financed um, an East German company to prove that it's possible to build uh, refrigerators without these damaging gases. 
And all the big industry at that time, they refused to build refrigerators without um, FCKV. And that was crazy, you know? And we face this stupid situation today as well, so that the problem is a little bit bigger, so we cannot point at the gas and say, okay, uh, fade out the gas. It's, it's a bigger problem, but still the industry is, is really not willing, and we're just thinking about who is the, like Greenpeace, who, who is it today, you know? Who, who is raising this question and campaigning against that? Couldn't it that be politics? So Green Freeze 2 is a kind of um, taking the story and building on it with a modular, um, with a modular approach to, to a refrigerator. And the element which is called uh, D is um, it's a cooling element which can be totally detached from the, from the uh, cooling space. So you can rent this as a service so you don't buy it. So someone else is responsible that it, it, it works forever. Um, if there is a problem, you just pack it and, and send it back and you get a, a, a new one. And for the rest, we thought it could be interesting to have a modular system. So this is um, in the kitchen scenario. And the cooling space has been built by craftsmen locally. It's just in wood, and the isolation is sheep wool. And we, we, we combine two different ideas. One is the technical cycle, and one is the biological cycle. And inside, because you need, um, because of cleanliness, uh, we use natural stone. So it will, um, it will last forever. And what, what we try to, to understand with this project is how, how we can reorganize labor as well. Because I think for the transition is, is, is one of the big issues is to reorganize labor. And so we have a part which is the freezing part which is industrial. And we have the bigger part where the value is created uh, locally. Um, which can be done by craftsmen. And the last project is the social vehicle. Um, the social vehicle is, in a way, um, the, one of our biggest challenges. Of course, we, we have uh, heard that in the last um, months, a lot of time is, is traffic. And we propose a um, solution which can, can be used in, in cities or peri-urban areas. It's a very small vehicle um, for up to th three, three persons. And we added as well one, one thing which is in the, in the climate strategy is that everyone produces um, the energy by, by him or herself. So on the, on the front window, you see um, an unfold um, solar panel, which you can uh, fold on the, on the roof. And you see clearly it comes not from the car. It comes more from, um, from a bicycle. It's very lightweighted. And this is one of the strategies of circular design, is really to reduce the amount of resources uh, used. And it's uh, one tenth of the, the resource of a car. And I, I think when we speak about transformation design, we have to rethink what designers do. And you can uh, imagine when we started to build a car in the studio that everyone, even in the studio, was wondering if we really go crazy now. But I, I think that's the chance that what design offers is they, they have really big abilities to do things, you know, and, and even may, maybe not a helicopter, but, you know, something with four um, wheels is a possibility. And this image here uh, shows again the approach to labor that is done locally. So the, the space frame of this vehicle is welded in a local um, shop, workshop. And you see, it's, it's, it fits perfectly on, on an existing very small um, space. 
So, so the idea is really to re-question this kind of globalized production supply chain, which we have for cars and we have for um, refrigerators, and, and try to understand which, which can we do locally again. And we hooked up as well with um, a project which is one of the pioneers of, of open design, which is the, um, with the open um, source ecology. And we put all our knowledge of this phase of doing the car on, 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 a, on a wiki. So <clears throat> this was an interesting experience as well. Usually you do things, you know, but, but documenting every step and trying to give another person the ability to follow what, what you have done in the last couple of months and where you get the screw and where you get the motor and where you get the, the batteries. And <clears throat> yeah, this, this, this was a new experience how to share what we do as a, as a designers with, with others and um, yeah, still raises, of course, the, the, the question of if we just go this direction, how do we make our living in the future? So, but I think there is enough money, you know. Someone could pay us, so the European Union could give us money in order to be, make a blueprint for a European car um, thing, you know. That's, that's, that's a possibility. What I really do not like is that that private companies get public money and do not give anything back, you know. And, and I think this needs to change when we, when we have um, this radically needs to change. Yeah, and as a last thought, uh, one of the first drivers, um, this was a very early stage of, of the car, was Kate Rayworth. She is one of the leading economists um, that we have and she came up with the idea of the donut economy. So the donut is the, um, the green area and outside boundaries, the planetary boundaries like climate change, um, diversity of species, um, and the inside uh, boundaries is the sustainable development goals. And you know, it's really easy like that, so just keep within the boundaries. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks for sticking around so late. Um, okay, so this is a photograph from the scene of Donald Trump's inauguration following his win in the 2016 US election, presidential elections. In an NBC interview soon after the inauguration, Trump's advisor, Kellyanne Conway, defended the White House press secretary, Sean Spicer's claim that Mr. Trump had attracted the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration. When told that that wasn't quite true, she replied airily, don't be so dramatic. He gave alternative facts. Almost immediately after Conway's interview, George Orwell's classic novel, 1984, spiked to number one on Amazon. The Twitter sphere responded to this with allusions to this particular quote. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. After sales of the novel shot up to 9,500%, Penguin announced plans for a special 75,000 copy reprint of Orwell's book. So, my question is, what is it about such works of fiction that resonate with people in a way that hard facts don't? How can something written in 1949 be so relevant today? So, I'm going to talk, I, I'm taking the, the liberty of using the term transformation design to really think about what it means to transform ourselves for a different future. Given the events happening in the US and the widespread anxieties around fake news, post-truth, and political disenfranchisement, people were looking for fables and stories to make sense of and navigate this strange new landscape. 
Unlike abstract analysis, stories like 1984 are so powerful because they are harmonious with the way we relate to the world. That said, what we call reality is more like a narrative masterpiece than anything objective. And I think deep down we know this. But of course we need to make the distinction between allegory and deception, but this, between the stories that seek to blind us and those that enable us to navigate our world. I want to bring a little bit of theory here because I think it's really important if you really want to imagine the kind of concept of transformation. So if stories are the structure of our world, then emotions are the primary motivating force in our lives. This is not to say that data and modeling and analytics are not important, but what is also evident is the fallacy that what moves us, what really moves us to act as individuals is deep scientific rationality. We are not cold rational actors in a Newtonian universe. That is just not how we have evolved to live. Emotions and feelings are not a luxury. They are a means of communicating our states of mind to others. They are also a way of guiding our judgments and decisions. Emotions bring the body into a loop of reason said Antonio Damasio. And today, now, more than ever, it is essential that we build on this emotional embodiment. Today, we are in a period of accelerating change and dizzying potential for both huge transformation, but also catastrophic failure. No wonder many of us experience feelings of overwhelm from the increasing speed and volume of information we are exposed to. This rate of change in the world around us is disorienting. Currently, the main ways to analyze and talk about these complex challenges is through vast clouds of data points. Although data can look scary, it is somehow disembodied, detached from what it references. That's why, despite the alarming warnings of climate change, it is evident that we are having trouble acting upon this disembodied data. Whilst we are trapped in our ever-complex present, the ability to extrapolate into the future is almost impossible because of this overwhelming amount of data and things going on around us. And you know what? There is enough scientific evidence that shows that you, when you imagine your future self, your brain does something weird. It stops acting as if you're thinking about yourself. Instead, it operates as if you're thinking about a completely different person. This is what behavioral economists call temporal distancing. Perhaps if people were able to pre-experience the future, or if it were possible to create mental simulations of the future that could trigger episodic memory, it may reduce this temporal distance to the future. Neuroscientists call this prospective brain, whose primary function is to use past experiences to anticipate future events. And that's what I and my partner, John Arden, do in our studio, Superflux, with a team of great colleagues. And also with my students at Design Investigations, which is why I'm going to challenge Harold. If you want to study things that are complex, come to our department. Anyway, later. So anyway, so um, what I would like to talk about is why imagining different possible futures and why Creating the ability to step into these worlds is important if we want to understand what could be or what we want to avoid and how the world could be transformed. Our work focuses on using the power of embodied stories and visceral experiences to simulate different possible futures and bringing them into the present, into the here and now, in order to catalyze an embodied engagement with the vast potential of the future, with a, with a different future, what could it be? And it's also about thinking of the present differently. The few, imagining the future is not because this is the future, it's about understanding how the present could be different. This is just a diagram showing how we operate, the temporal layers within which we operate. So there is the idea of consensus reality, and around it are the established narratives that build on this consens consensual reality. But then there are these further peripheral outer layers of the strange now and the future possibilities. And so we very much think of the future as old. The future is not going to be new or shiny, it's old, it's all around us already, and it's not a straight line. It's not now and the present, it's history, it's present, it's multiple futures. Um, 
And so uh, what I will do is just talk a couple of examples of some of our works. Um, this was a project we did with the government of the United Arab Emirates that it illustrates the potential of such visceral features. So the Ministry of Energy invited us to help them shape their country's energy strategy all the way up to 2050. They wanted to make policy changes, but you have to remember that when you're making policy changes, you're not just affecting numbers on a graph. Those numbers mean something very real. So based on the government's data, economic data, we created this large city model and visualized many possible futures on it, from doing nothing if you don't invest any money in renewables, no change, to invest a lot of money for completely zero carbon future, so kind of five versions. Um, and so I was excitedly taking this group of government officials and the prime minister and members of energy companies through one sustainable future scenario on our model, when one of them told me, I can't imagine that people in the future will stop driving cars and use public transport instead. And then he said, there's no way I can tell my own son not to drive his car. This is the UAE, by the way. But we were prepared for this reaction. Working with scientists in a chemistry lab in my hometown, home city in India, we had created approximate samples of what the air will be like in 2030 if our behavior stays the same. And so I walked the group over to this object that emits vapor from those air samples. Just one whiff of the noxious polluted air from 2030 brought home the point that no amount of data can. This is not the air you would allow your children to breathe. This is not the future you would allow your children to inherit. The government, a few days later, made a huge announcement. They've been investing billions of dollars in renewables. Now, we don't know exactly what part our future experiences played in that decision, but we know that they've changed their policy to mitigate such a scenario. So what we are learning through our work is that one of the most powerful means of affecting change is when people can directly, tangibly, and emotionally experience some of the future consequences of their actions today in the present moment. Um, so let's zoom out. Um, Harold spoke a lot about climate change. Um, so. I mean, I, I, ho I hope I'm, I'm not going to repeat. Um, trying to understand this, this very complex phenomenon. Um, and we are often confronted with data and projections like this. And it's really hard to imagine the unsurmountable amount of problems we might face. I found that most people in their everyday lives are at a loss of how to make sense of this graph. As Timothy Morton writes, we have built computing systems that can model climate in real time. But our regular common sense perception can't compute terabytes of global climate information or sense nanosecond timescales. Most mornings, I can't even find my coffee grinder. For something quite so complex climate, as climate change, Morton coined a term called hyperobjects. According to him, we have created things that we can hardly understand, let alone control, let alone make sensible political decisions about. A new word to understand how mind-blowing this is, is hyperobjects. Hyperobjects are phenomena like radioactive materials and global warming. Hyperobjects stretch our ideas of time and space since they far outlast most human timescales or they are massively distributed in terrestrial space and are so unavailable to immediate experience. So at Superflux, we wanted to condense this vast amorphous form of climate change hyperobject into things that are recognizable, tangible, and understandable. One of the things we zoomed in is the implication of climate change on global trade and food. Climate data projections suggest that by 2050, per capita food consumption will grow from 32 kilos today to 52 kilos, along with increased volatility in price and production. On the other hand, increase in heavy rainfall events might continue to lead to flooding, destroying crops, as well as devastating food assets, etc., etc. It's going to be pretty rough. Based on such projections, we explored one possible future where the Western world moves from abundance to scarcity. We imagine living in a city 
like London, with repeated flooding, periods with almost no food in supermarkets, economic instabilities, broken supply chains. What can we do to not just survive, but prosper in such a world? What food can we eat? To really get inside these questions, we did a ton of live prototyping. We explored the possibility of transforming our homes into spaces for food production, gaining hands-on knowledge around new and emerging ways of growing food. And so we started building food computers from scratch, using the technique of fog ponics, so just fog, no water or soil, to grow things really quickly. We wanted to build them in the cheapest way possible, from salvaged, abandoned, and repurposed materials turning today's waste into tomorrow's dinner. So let me, this is, uh, this is a glimpse of our early experiments with John and our son. Um, and then the, uh, take you to the final outcome, which took the form of an installation, um, which transported people into a London flat, perhaps around 20, 50 or so, when our seven-year-old son would be around our age. At first glance, a seemingly comfortable living space designed for a world of automated living, global trade, and material abundance. But then, on closer inspection, a realization that the apartment had been adapted to a future it was never meant to inhabit. Discarded newspapers and a radio show reflected the tensions of this new world. A smart panel constantly asking the fridge smart fridge to refill milk, but where is the milk in this future? Amongst the detritus of now obsolete smart devices and designer goods lives a new reality transformed by the impact of climate change. Recipes and cookbooks in the kitchen reflect the change in food production, storage and consumption. Experimental food production now occupies space once given to relaxation, transforming the apartment into a space for growing and producing food. Resourcefully hacked together consumer items, IKEA shelves, decorative fog makers, computer fans, programmable microcontrollers, plumbing supplies, LED lamps. Fog oozing out of these contraptions, blinding purple light. The droning sounds of water pipes, snares, fox skin, algae, and mycelium, all bearing fruit in the blasted ruins of capitalism. Looking beyond, there lies a city familiar, yet alien. Mitigation of shock was a project shown at the CCCB in Barcelona. The intention of such speculative approach with hands-on experimentation is that it offers us the opportunity to very directly step into familiar space to confront our fears not to scare or overwhelm, but to help people critically reflect upon their actions in the present, and to actually introduce them to potential adaptations in the future. The evidence in the apartment may reflect a different future, but all the food computers we built were in fully working condition. There was no speculation there. Whilst many saw this as an early warning, we really wanted to empower people by demonstrating that we have the potential to rise to the challenges of the future today. And we started putting the recipes of how to build these computers on Instructables and hope to continue doing so. So what this goes to show is something that we think about a lot with friends of mine, Jake Dunnigan and Stuart Candy talk about, that it's better to be surprised by a simulation than to be blindsided by reality. And one of these ways, these kind of simulations can help us not be woken up with a bad nightmare, but to start preparing ourselves, indeed transforming from today. I just want to kind of briefly talk a little bit about design investigations, the course at the University of Applied Arts, the Angevante, that I lead. Um, again, uh, the, the emphasis on the students is that we treat these issues as our materials. It, is, it used to be industrial design too, so very much the roots are based in industrial design. The students are taught through materials and learning to build. But the fact is that they are going to be designers in the 21st and 22nd century. They cannot shy away from these complex challenges. And so um, 
the, the students address issues around climate change, but deal with materials. And really, the focus is to avoid solutionism. That is a big part of the challenge, to acknowledge the humility that every solution a designer comes up with will have its own problems. Everything is interconnected. We as designers are part of the problem. And so we have to get out of this hubris that I have a solution to things, but instead stay with the trouble, understand the complexities, and try and work and respond to these challenges. Um, this is um, just a glimpse of um, the projects the students did. Uh, they uh, explored a future, near future Austrian alpine uh, rural landscape, uh, different projects that were shown at the London Design Biennale last year. You know, everything from what would it mean for really deprive farmers to use illegal methods and create drones to geoengineer cloud and rain. They called it illegal rain. All the way to what does it mean to restitute a glacier? What, there's the, I can't even say the name of this massive glacier uh, that is collapsing and dying. Um, the students thought about how they might bring it back to life. What would it mean to rebuild and restore the dignity of a glacier? So these are just tiny specks that we begin to understand, reveal what is a deeply complex world, that everything is interconnected and interdependent. And we as human beings are not the ones who are at the center of the universe. This anthropocentric view of the world, that we can change and transform the world, is hubristic. And we need to step away from it and understand that we are one of the many species and we need to work with everything to be in, in ecological harmony. This is a book that we published about the project. Um, um, that if you wanted to grab a copy from Berkhauser, uh, the publishers. Um, so the value of these kind of narratives isn't that they compete or replace the dominant ones, but they create a space for to think imaginatively. Otherwise, you're locked into a single world frame that isn't your own. And that's why we believe that it's important to imagine and create living prototypes and blueprints for many different alternate presents and futures, counter narratives to disrupt the dominant paradigm. I really keep going back. I wear this quote on my sleeve by Ursula Le Guin. Sometimes the most direct way to tell the truth is to tell a totally implausible story, like a myth. That way you avoid the muddle of pretending the story ever happened or ever will happen. Thank you. Uh, hello, and thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I feel a little bit like an alien because I'm a business person. Uh, we invest a lot in startups, uh, young people, beautiful ideas beautiful, positive energy, so I'm really happy with that. But uh, today it's going to be a little different. I have a, a system, and Christoph already mentioned my work also for the Minister of Finance, transformation design. Without doubt, our systems are socially, politically, economically, everybody feels that, I think, uh, economically are the on the brink of a radical change. Uh, so far, this transition is the most important issue we have, I think. It started a long time ago in Red, whoever looked after it in, uh, there was this uh, think tank, Red, called in, in London, uh, Tony Blair already, so a long, long time ago, really. They were very good in reflections, as everybody else also. They were very good in thinking but not so good in doing. And to get the change going, as urgent as it is, I don't have to mention climate change and everything else, uh, we need a do tank. We need something which is uh, done now. There's no big, big uh, changes uh, or no big time left. I want to concentrate, and that's the alien thing maybe, a little bit on, on a different issue on social and economic systems. Also social and economic systems on the brink. Uh, 
we are in an overflow of civilization products, uh, as somebody mentioned already today. Everybody has TVs and uh, cars and whatever. Uh, sometimes the TVs are bigger than the living room. I, I mean, it's really getting absurd in, in, in many, many ways. Uh, the cars was mentioned already. Uh, it's a very important thing, the CO2 emissions, whatever. So we have to, maybe we should think reduction. Uh, now everybody, when you hear reduction, thinks of I'm losing, I'm losing something, I'm going to lose whatever, my standard of living, for example. But it's not necessarily like that, that you don't lose something. We have a lot of people who talk about life, uh, work-life balances. Of course, they reduce, but they re reduce things on their better. They reduce uh, their lifestyle on what they like. They like their lifestyle better than before. Uh, growth, definitely, forever, is not going to be the answer uh, for now. Uh, the culture of more is maybe really, really getting to an end. Uh, I'm talking on a high level, maybe, because a lot of people in the world, if you don't look, you look outside of Europe, outside of Austria, uh, there's not so many TVs all over. Maybe less work and more income, if I say this as a sentence, less work, more income, most people, at least at my age, will think it's not possible. How can, you, how can you have less work and more income? But there comes the idea, which is my, so to say, uh, not new idea, but uh, celebrated idea is basic income for everybody. Also, that sounds strange, because where's the money coming from? Uh, and if you remember, just one picture for you, uh, in the industrial age, 1900, beginning before 1900, people were working for 80 hours a week and had much, much less income and much less standard of living as today. Today we work, whatever, 30 hours a week, and we have a much higher standard of living. So this, this picture alone shows that it's possible. It is, it is not, a, so to say, systematic uh, connection to that. It's thinkable, it's doable, and uh, uh, I don't want to elaborate too long uh, for on this industrial age and, and the, the work stage. Uh, now we come to the digital age and the AIs, uh, which will take uh, many jobs from us and whatever everybody says, there will be so many programmers and, and coders, and uh, I don't believe in that. I think there's going to be half of the population minimum out of work, no jobs, as we are used to now, uh, maybe more, maybe up to 80%. So what we definitely have to, we have to go new ways. Uh, the difficulty is the transition into the new way. At the end, what I'm just going to present you in a minute, uh, it's clearer, but the way to there is, is, is uh, more dangerous, I think. Digital AI is, for example, uh, just a little picture because I was very impressed in that. We were some time ago in Cambridge at a discussion. In Cambridge Trinity, they work on AIs for a long time. It was a serious discussion at lunch, and I'm not kidding. And everybody jumps on me when I tell him that, but just reporting uh, that AIs, artificial intelligence, robots, they will, dis they will uh, develop uh, consciousness. They will develop feelings anyway. Feelings are chemistry. But uh, they will develop consciousness. They will be a separate or a, their own species. Species we can negotiate with, we can make contracts with. We have, yeah, we have to be careful what this is going to be. But they, were s they will take the jobs and we do the jobs better. As nowadays, Vienna is a typical city. Most of you will not know that, but there were big brick factories. Wienerberg, it's called out there, in the end of the 19th century. And people working, they are not living 80 hours, they were dying. Uh, nowadays, it's all machinery done. This picture, again, in 10, 20 years, and it's going faster than we think, will be AIs doing that, even whatever you think about it. Uh, medics, I see many medical startups with, with AIs already. 
So uh, even in caretaking, there will be machines. And I think it's a good idea. I'm not afraid of that. I think it's a good idea. But in that transformation system, we have to think economically uh, and socially, where will the people be? Where will our people be? The systems can be easily changed, thinkable and doable. If you imagine in the future, and it's a, not a tax system actually, the sum of the GDP, that's what, every, what the people in a certain entity, let's say Austria, work, the sum of this GDP minus the capital costs, minus the cost of the machinery, minus the salary of the people who are still working, and the rest, let's call it profit of the society, will be distributed per capita to everybody living in this society. If you know what I mean to repeat it, the, so to say the power of, a, of an economy, Austrian or European, whatever, minus some costs, especially salaries, will be left over, there will be left over a profit and this profit can be distributed like a social dividend to everybody, per, very important, per capita, of course. And this, you can call at the end, is basic income. That's what we have already a little bit in the beginning anyway. And so actually, I don't even think it's very, it's very hard to understand or to do this system. The harder thing is the way to get there. Uh, well, in between, uh, you will have uh, only few people and more people. Now we have discriminations with people who don't work or with people who don't want to work. It's the more important thing. The second point where I have no solution, but I just want to mention it, is socially, uh, so to say economically, people will have enough money to live and have a higher standard of living maybe than now and work and not work even or work a little bit. What are people doing socially in that time? Are they, they cannot be all artists and they will not be all uh, uh, sportsmen and running around doing sports or arts. There's a big part of people who will not, of course you can have many interests, especially in that, what I mentioned, sports. But what, what these people will do, we have to work on, I think. I have no solution for that. So generally, I think we should move on. Let's move on to a new society in a much greater, in, or in a great environment, and especially for everybody, even in the whole world. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, really, really inspiring presentations. Um, I think we have a lot to discuss. The session is supposed uh, to last till 7. We will kind of then wind up at 7 at the latest. Please stay because it's going to be really interesting. I have a reputation of asking the most difficult questions. And I'm trying to find them now. Uh, I'll probably I propose that I ask two questions myself and you can comment on them. Uh, and then we open up to the floor. The, the first one is a very general question, but please uh, no uh, lectures on this. Just an, how should I say, not, not an ideological answer, rather an emotional answer. And the question is, Let's talk capitalism. Um, my vision is of an eco-social circular capitalism for the future, where the circular economy plays a major role, of course, yeah? and it has to be ecological, it has to be social um, in a sustainable way. And I would uh, like to ask you, what is your idea of the future of capitalism? In all, against the background of the problems we were discussing about, against the background of the necessary transition design. I mean, it has been touched on in some of the lectures already, but please give me an emotional answer, not an ideological answer. I'm living up to my reputation, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to start? 
Maybe the native. Nobody. Are you? Yeah, yeah. You go, you go. Okay. Nobody wants to start. <laughs> uh, I'm too close. It's a really difficult question. So, uh, I mean, they, they say capitalism is the only uh, system, it's the worst system we have, like democracy, but it's the only one working because it goes back to the ego of surviving, that people want to survive. So, I think uh, biologically, we are concepted that we want to eat, we want to live, we want to survive. So capitalism, in a way, will always be there and will not go away. Besides that, whatever we saw on socialism, on uh, China, for example, is what they call in Germany, Stamokap. This is state, state monopolistic capitalism, which is about the same again as capitalism. So I, the only, the, the main issue is to, it's like a tiger, you, know, you have a tiger in your courtyard and you kind of have to, a beautiful animal, really beautiful animal, but keep it down. Keep it a little down so that it doesn't eat you. Anna? Um, um, so <laughs> I, um, it depends when, what kind of, what time frame you're talking. So already the carbon emissions that are, if we stop emitting carbon completely today, the emissions that are already out in the atmosphere will last for 100 years. So, um, so this is the reality of the situation is things are going to happen to us. We are not going to be able to do much quite quickly. And, and, and a lot of people say that I think the problem is we haven't been able to imagine an alternative. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So the life as we know it will end. Does not mean there is no other way of life. So I think a post-capital life is possible to imagine and should be imagined. I think the problem with current form of capitalism is that power is concentrated in the hands of a very few. And so there's lots of resources and then very few people get the power to use them. And um, that is the problem currently. It's kind of, it's not distributed. Uh, the, the, it, capitalism has created severe inequalities, basically. And that's my problem with it. And there is a Johannes vision that the profit after the costs, you know, will be distributed to society. But who decides? Yeah. Exactly, who decides? Yeah. And I have a, a follow-up question before coming yes, to Harald. That's terrifying. On that, uh, we always talk, we have talked about machinery tax. It's very clear that we need a sub substantial tax reform everywhere, at least in the global north, knowing the systems. I don't know the other systems so well. Um, and the question is, um, in the scenario you have described, AI tax plays a key role, right? Yeah? Okay, so let's start work on that. Harald. I think we, we are all used and, and profit in a way from capitalism, so it's... Um so we live a good life, you know, and, and, and it is said that capitalism is able to raise the, you know, have more people living in a better situation. I think that happened in the past, but we have now reached a point where things go into a strange direction. And I think um, a solution which is not that radical, think about uh, capitalism, which you have as an, a metaphor, just you keep it um, in a way <clears throat> down. And I think what keeps capitalism, could ca keep the capitalism down is what I've showed, uh, the idea of Kate Rivers to keep it within the boundaries, the, the natural boundaries and the boundaries of being human around the world, not, not being human here, but being, have a humanistic approach to, to, to everything around the world and being uh, world citizens, that, that's... That's actually the yeah. description of liberalism. No, it's getting ideolo ideological, okay. I think all of you are what all of you are now describing is not capitalism as we know it today. So you're already imagining an alternative here yeah. right now, so yeah. And, and I think the, the task is also to decouple growth from capitalism, or rather capitalism from growth as we have known it, right? Yeah. yeah. But the message is, after this first round, that yes, capitalism will stay, in a way. 
I guess so. Uh, and it's uh, strong enough to evolve into that direction we, because no best, better system has been invented so far. Yeah. Can I, can I say something revive that? What you said I think is true. I don't even know if my system I described where an economy takes the overflow, whatever stays left, and distributes it on, as basic income to everybody is capitalist at all. That's a different discussion, yeah. Maybe not. Well, I'm Maybe sure, not, actually yeah. not. It's a different system. Yeah, it's a different it still works capitalistic in the, yeah. in the basic, if you say, like a company, and then you have the, the social dividend, and you distribute it to everybody, like to all the workers in the factory, for example, you can do that too. That's not so capitalistic anymore. You know, what, you, what happens now also in the, in the corporate world is this huge discussion about what is the goal of a company. Is it only profit, Milton Friedman and so on? And in the very recent past, this has taken on enormous speed because a lot of companies think, no, we also really have to put the social good to give back to society at the very center of the companies. I mean, it's a lot of uh, kind of good washing in the sense, but there's more behind it, I think. Yeah? And for me, this is also a way of how capitalism can evolve. Yeah. And my second question before opening up the floor is, um, I was kind of irritated by Anup's remark, or at least uh, her advice to the students, avoid solutionism, solutionism, solutionism uh, and stay with the trouble. I nevertheless think that we, that we need solutions. The question is, what kind of solutions? And I would like to bring in two preconditions for that. And they were kind of touched upon or mentioned uh, earlier today. One is we need cooperation. Tear down the walls, cooperate be, uh, between disciplines, not only between artistic disciplines, but also, uh, also all kind of sectors of society where it makes sense. Yeah? But then you're in a much better position to come up with the right solutions. But you need solutions. And the other one is uh, you need a holistic mindset, uh, which is not to be uh, confounded with a comprehensive system and solution that excludes other systems. It's a different thing. Yeah. So I would like to get your comments on that. Uh, maybe you can briefly explain what you mean with avoid solutionism. Yeah, so I think what you are, so I'm not saying like, you know, yes, my phone keeps falling out of my hands, please design something that will make sure it doesn't keep slipping. Yeah, you need a solution there. But I think we frame the language of design as I am a designer, I'm a problem solver, and I must solve this problem. And what has resulted in over the last hundred years of industrial design since industrial revolution is that we've created products that have gone from addressing needs to creating desires and then saying I'm solving a problem. So I think it's that mindset that, and it is true that you say, okay, hey, I'm going to have a problem that's going to depollute this part of this river. Where does that, where are you shifting that problem? Like everything that you're going to create a solution to within that small thing, I think as long as designers recognize that that means you're going to Shift it, you're shifting it or creating something different as a challenge. Even if I'm fully doing a recycling thing within my house, that there are repercussions of that in ways that I think, I think what's important for designers is to understand that when, we, then they, when they make something and put it in the world, it will have implications. And so I think I'm just trying to um, connect, connect things that they should be, which is what you are referencing to as circular economy or whatever you call it, that we understand the role we play in society. Right. What you was the question? To. You don't have to. <laughs> if, okay. if designers are problem solvers. <laughs> That's what I think. Um, yeah, I think we have to reframe um, what is presented to us as problems, you know. Uh, this, this is to be critical about a product brief, you know. Um, and really, as you said, look, look behind and, and, and try to reflect what's, what's real challenges 
For example, if uh, I bring that down to the refrigerator, we have 20 kilograms of electronic waste each person mm -hmm. in Austria every year, not within our whole lifetime, but every year. And 60% of this electronic waste is big appliances like refrigerators. And you know, th this is something we can challenge and, and, and try to create new solutions for that. But, but yeah, I think changing, uh, when we speak about transition design, we have to, to reframe and rethink our role as designers in society, not alone and not against someone, but, but together with. I just have an abstract answer to that. Uh, solutions rather always have a solution than no solution. Uh, meaning, uh, especially in climate change, we are talking about that every day. Better, of course, you think it through what's going to happen in design, I don't know, but in social systems, in technical systems. And if you have done that, then do it. Yeah. I'm fed up, too much fed up with all thinking and think, as I said that before, think tanks and, and thinking about it and let's do it. Do it. Just do it. And if you see it's going the wrong way, then change it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we're opening up. Uh, please ask questions. Uh, let us know of your comments. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, thank you for the, this conference. It has been really interesting. I especially loved uh, this part, the bridge, bridge and the um, kitchen uh, cow. <laughs> um, but in general, it seems to me that what was discussed was mostly about how to um, improve um, the ex existing uh, technology, um, especially in the first two parts of the conference, um, and to how to improve its values rather than to change them. Um, so as it was shown in one of the presentations before, uh, if I understood it right, behavior should change uh, before the system does. And for so we have to change also the way we experience uh, all these data, materials, and designs. Um, but as somebody already pointed out in the audience, um, it is hard for uh, some people to accept New, new systems, um, and I agree, so my question is, <laughs> and finally, um, and I'm sorry if I'm um, way out um, of the topic here, um, but why don't these data, materials, and design have also some focus in spirituality, and I mean, I mean it not in a religious way, uh, but in a way to um, encourage awakeness of consciousness and well-being in order to have more uh, this uh, awareness um, of our relationship with this nature that we are trying to save <laughs> and then have also a better understanding of these new systems that are new to come. So that's it. Thank you. Does anybody want Want to comment on that? I can. Uh, I mean, I think that's a really good question, actually. Um, I think when you stop um, thinking about growth, when you stop saying that we are in a world with infinite growth, when you say that we're living in a world of uh, finite, that, that our time on this earth is finite and growth is finite, if we start Acknowledging that there's already a spiritual aspect to the fact that we are all um, here for a certain amount of time, and that is a limited time. And same is that true for the planet, that we can't keep mining the resources of the Earth for it because it's not infinite. And so I think that requires actually quite a lot of spiritual awareness. And also the idea that we are not at the center of the universe, if we shift the anthropocentric view, then I feel that already also requires a certain amount of uh, spiritual uh, awareness. So I think it's, you're right. And I think a lot of people try and find that uh, spiritual hook 
through religion, but also through nature or through other things. And, 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 but, and, and many people don't, which is why also there's a lot of rise in anxiety and mental health problems and a lot of other things. May I uh, add also a much more prosaic point of view to that? Um, and I stand to be corrected, Katya, for instance. Um, I think it also has to do th with the fact that um, the kind of two uh, foremost uh, digital innovation areas in the world, the US and uh, Eastern Asia, uh, have this tendency that's in the digital to kind of reduce us humans to ones and zeros, you know, to translate everything we do, we think, etc., into the digital because there's money to be made from it. Um, and biologically, it may even to a large extent be true, but I think it's a very bad mindset. And the same, of course, happens in China, I would say, yeah, with industries uh, forcing AI, etc. We want to be the first, and they probably are already by 2030 or much earlier. So I think it also has to do with that. And so it's in our foremost interest to keep up the spiritual side uh, of humanity. And it's, a, it's, a, it's something we have to be aware of. And if you remember reading Homo Deus by Harari, it's really about those two types uh, of humans of the future, and humans is probably the wrong word, uh, data is, that's the highest category. So we are here in this world to create data and to build machines that analyze data. And, and before that, the transhumanists, uh, we are here to kind of go beyond uh, humans. And um, I'm a fan of a digital humanism in the sense that we try to evolve, but to try to stick also with uh, our humanity. Yeah. It's a difficult discussion, and I think that Europe has here a different, there's much at stake, and Europe can build here a different model that's not based on this reductionist visions, I call them now, provocatively. Mm. Yeah? I have one, one comment to, to the spiritual. Um, what, what comes into my mind is, is, if we speak about transition in this panel, um, Humankind has always invented transitional rituals to come from A to B, become adult. You have a transitional ritual to become married. You have a transitional ritual. Maybe we, we have to invent such a ritual for this big transition. Uh, I don't know. This maybe addresses a little bit the spiritual to really, and, and what's Really interesting is that, that many of these rituals, they have two, three phases, so you detach from, from the current, and then the transitional phase is always something where you th turn things upside down. So this is how many uh, archaic cultures dramatize this state of transition, is to put things upside down. Maybe we have to think about how, how we could do that really this transitional phase and, and then really maybe, as you ask and I ask myself, how do we get there? Maybe we get there through mythology and ritual. How do we design a beautiful ending? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to growth, there's a simple answer for me. It's very simple. Uh, it's fashion, actually. There's lots of fashions where, which are intermediate goals, so to say, on a change. It's not only short skirt, long skirt, but uh, in growth, uh, I don't, there's the fashion, or in bike, uh, bicycles, there's this fashion, everybody's really happy with this bicycle, it's something special, nobody talks about cars anymore. Uh, why the hell do you have a car, what's a car? I have a beautiful bicycle, it's suddenly fashion, not mentioning that this costs also 10,000 euros, uh, but doesn't matter. But to, to, get, feet, to get you know? sexy, yeah, to get, <laughs> to get like uh, reduce growth or reduce uh, consume, consuming can also become sexy. That's very simple, Absolutely. actually. Okay, other questions? We still have Katya. Thank you. I'm I was waiting for this.
<laughs> Thank you very much. I actually have three questions. One to you, Harold, is what you developed with this human-sized car very much draws from the rickshaws or the other forms of mobility that are actually globally transporting more than 60% of passengers and goods globally on the last mile. So how much in your idea to create a creative commons you relied on this and also draw back on the creative commons, not the creative commons license, but I think that would be my first question to you. And I, I totally feel you and I, we, we know that the narratives and the stories work very strongly. And I, I fully, completely agree with you. I have, but I have one question on this uh, apartment because one of those romanticizing ideas is urban farming. And I would like to know how much calories did you produce with this setup and where did the energy come from in the dystopian future? Because I think we very often give people this like, easy way out stories and you know yeah the calories really i want to know them yeah. and and johannes i've been mostly struggling like really trying to rethink is like if we have a system a society that produces together and where we discount the worker put in the uh, resources and industrial put in and all the benefits that go out of it go to each one based on capita where's the distinction to communism in this system so where why is this not a new way <laughs> to discuss it and not that I <laughs> challenge the notion <laughs> whether it's good or bad it's just like I need to understand is there a difference uh, or, or what, what is it thank you now we are talking <laughs> I was first. first yeah. yeah, you're totally right. So, so the, the, there is a really um, a strong reference to, to these mobility um, solutions in, in the global south. And we, what we, what we try to achieve is really to to translate this into an object which is still abstract in a way. So it's it's not a kind of consumer good. So it, it looks a little bit. Um, strange and and what we what we found out is is quite interesting because uh, four wheels is really stupid with such a small car you should use three wheels and and this this was a you know at that point we didn't change it because we wanted to have this transition and say okay it has four wheels this is something you know and you know why not using that and and we consciously we have no pedals so we we have just um, but but yes, if you consequently think this idea through, you you end up with the major mobility solution in in China, which is three wheel uh, mobility, and 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 in many many other places. And uh, but but we as designers, we still struggled with the you know going that far. And 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 just one remark. Uh, when, when you see these vehicles as a leisure car in, in, in our culture, people are totally happy, they're smiling, you know, and if they're in the cars, they're aggressive, and, and it's, it's, you know, objects can really change how people behave, and, and that's interesting. So, good question. Um, so, I think a few things here. One is that this is not an exercise in prediction. So, um, we are not at any point saying that this is going to be the apartment in the future. Um, the biggest intention of the project was to be able to get people into the space, into a very familiar space. Um, the idea was not, never to say this apartment is going to cover all your calorific needs when you live and grow here. It was to show that your, you will require a major transformation in your domestic life. There will be economic instabilities, supply chains could be broken, it'd be difficult to grow food outside. We're not relying on industrial scale, urban vertical farms, which we think is actually problematic. It's about actually stepping into a world. So it's not so much about saying, hey, you're going to grow this, 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 which is going to give you so much calories. It's saying we could 
we could live in a future which could look like this. It is not the only, just one possibility. It, is, it was mostly to connect emotionally people with a future that they could not imagine otherwise. So I think the lot of feedback we got from people ranged from absolute abject fear to hope all the way through, like people were terrified that this couldn't, this couldn't be the way, this couldn't be my home, to all the way to, yeah, actually, I didn't realize I had, we have these cheap technologies and these tools that I want to start prototyping and building these things and at least address some of my food needs in different ways. I start to understand my relationship to food. I'm not distanced to it. Like, this is not a thing I just buy from the supermarket anymore. So I think there are many different things playing here. And until you materially conceive it, it's, you can keep on talking about it. So I think that was the main point. It's not to say all your calorie needs will be met by it. The, there is a plan. I think if somebody will fund us to live in such an apartment for a year, I hopefully won't die and just live off it. But that is, there is a desire to create this experiment where we would actually want to, because we are building these things and these things are actually growing. Um, the problem comes like, do I want to kill the fox and eat it? And all these ethical challenge questions start coming in. That's what actually we wanted to address. So yeah. Fascinating, thank you. Um, communism, great question. Uh, theoretically, it cannot be the same because uh, communism, or practically it has not never been lived like that. Uh, besides that, it's not, everybody will not be the same, still not, so to say. Will not In my system, not everybody is the same because there's people who have the basic income they will make a nice living and they have their whatever. And then there's people working, they have a little more, of course, because they're working. And there's people who, who finance the machinery and they also have a little more. I think what, that's why actually the past communism, capitalism discussion maybe in the future is over and out. It's over and out because the, the thing is, to my opinion, it goes on the level of the differences. How big is the difference? Is there somebody with everything and anything and somebody dying on hunger because it doesn't have anything? How, how is the level? And this system levels out. This gives some people a little more and some people maybe a little less, but they have more fun maybe and the others have not so much fun, whatever. <laughs> but it levels out. There's no, uh, and communism would be all the same, which never worked by the way anyway. So to say, to put it with George Orwell, Animal Farm, in communism, everybody is the same, but some are a little bit more of the same than the others. I don't know if that, that's a, the original, I always heard it in German. Uh, so here you would say, everybody's almost equal. Slightly, but not exactly equal. Okay, uh, other questions? Yes? Maybe following a bit up on, um Johannes' uh, topic, where I, I really like the idea of more is less, as you put it, um, and I also think there is an urge to, to consume less and use less, and we, if you just look at food production, we throw away a third of all the food that we produce every year worldwide. So I think, I, I'm just wondering, what, what is your opinion? How do you think we can reduce? How do you think we can change the mindset of us in this room the world in general in consuming less, using less. Because we are producing more than we can ever use. And you say you buy a bike, but then you buy three of them. You know, you need a racing bike, you need a city bike, and then you need another bike for the mountain. So what is the difference from buying a car? So there is, a, there, there is this consume orientation that we all have because we cannot get enough. But we do it very ecologically yeah. in our little world. And there we need to change our minds, I think. But like your comment on that. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, <laughs> I, I know this is a little difficult to consume less, but uh, again, it can be sexy to consume less. It can be, I never imagined that I can eat no meat and I eat practically no meat. I never could imagine. So it can be, it can become a little movement to that. But the problem is, I see differently, the problem is not the consumer itself, the problem is the hidden persuader, that's the industry producing. 
So if you produce and produce and produce, you have to sell it. So you have to have some ideas that the industry finds different business models and produces less. And at the same moment, uh, that the consumer does not want to consume so much. Right now, we're in a very bad period, I think. There's so much money, lots of money running around. And I hear that all the time. It, actually, we're in a, sorry, there's a little excursion uh, that if it's antique cars, antique watches, if it's property, real estate, whatever, there's so much money running around that even not so rich people who have whatever, some money on the savings account, they realize they're losing one or two percent every year on that savings. So they start spending it. There's one thing you can buy real estate or you can go and eat good or buy a, the third bicycle or whatever. So uh, right now, is according to the situation we have, I think a big consuming period uh, out of, out of, yeah, the zero interest uh, policy we have. So, but you're right, this, this will not be so easy. Without the industry to produce less, we'll not, never get there. And you're talking here from the perspective of the global north, you know, it's a yeah. slightly different in the global south, so not slightly, but really different. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, we have five minutes to go. Is there any other question? Yes, one that's not the last. Um, what I was actually missing these two days is maybe I, I came two hours late today, I must admit, uh, but I have not heard about the ecological footprint. And I think this could come to that consuming less may become sexy and also economically for the, for the person concerned of some value. But of course, there is the danger that it becomes what we call in Austria this night gesellschaft or controlling the neighbors. So it, it should not be too much on the individual, but maybe on the goods consumed, or that even the firms, that they get a quota of ecological points and have to be careful in using them up. So, right. so actually I've heard that Vienna City is uh, considering bringing uh, their own version of the social credit system for your ecological footprint as an actual, very actual plan. Yeah. And there is, a, every government in the world has a policy around carbon tax. They're just terrified to implement it. Um, already we saw what side happening in France a little bit. So um, yeah, it's, it, it will come. Yeah. And we have touched upon it, and it's, it was always present in the room. I could sense it. <laughs> uh, I've also senses, you know. <laughs> and uh, I think I can also tell you that um, climate care will be a big topic in the years to come. Um, and of course, ec ecological footprint is everywhere as a topic. And, and so stay tuned. It will be big. Yeah. Um, I want to really conclude, um, and uh, thank you very much. I was wondering what to bring you uh, in content as a conclusion, and I have brought you two things. One I came across this morning when riding the tram to the conference, uh, and it was about the, book, the new book, which is supposedly kind of controversial, not super good, by Jonathan Seff and Foa, it's now in German. We are the climate, we are Sintas Klima, I don't know if that's the original English title. It's supposed to be very interesting. Uh, and he makes reference to Roosevelt and the policies um, when a lot had to be saved in order to fight Hitler. Yeah, and, and I couldn't believe it, uh, it was um, tax of 94%, uh, share meat, then uh, velocity 35 kilometers per hour uh, to save, of course, uh, and uh, don't and share cars. Quote: Who rides a car alone rides with Hitler. 
<laughs> that was uh, at that time. And the second one, so I mean these uh, radical measures, yeah? And the second one is with Kant. I was thinking about a categorical, ecological or ecosocial imperative. And, that, and it's very simple what Kant wrote. Act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. And it's very uh, relevant in this context because we're always talking about individual deeds, our behavior, changing our behavior, or other people saying as long as uh, the government or the China or so doesn't change its behavior, it doesn't count what I do. Every step counts, but we also need the big systemic changes, but we need individual behavioral changes. And in that sense, I think that this uh, eco-social categorical imperative uh, by Kant is a very good bridge. So think about your personal things that, with your will that it become universal law. That's very important. So I want to conclude on that note. Um, I would like to thank the AZW for its hospitality and again the AZW but also the other institutional partners, the Slovak Design Center, the Kunsthalle Wien, uh, and the MAC for jointly organizing this conference. I would like uh, to thank the European Union for its interact program, Slovakia, Austria, which basically financed this conference. And I would like uh, to thank uh, all the speakers, keynote lecturers, uh, but also all of you for your contributions uh, also for listening, for coming to this event and uh, stay tuned. As I said, there is more to come on these topics. We want transformation and we will get it. Thank you very much. <laughs>